Uh, thank you, Rochelle. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is staying safe. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about configuring ATP services in Nebula. Um, I did a previous webinar focusing on the, uh, the, the security services for the USG Flex, um, and there were some things that were in the security services menu that pertain specifically to the ATP. So those are the ones that I'm going to go over today. I'm going to touch on some of the, uh, the ones that I covered previously, just uh, real quick, just to kind of give a quick overview. Uh, but then I'm going to be focusing on the new aspects of the new security services that are available in the ATP. So real quick, let's go ahead and go over the agenda. Uh, the first thing I want to do is, since we recently had an update to Nebula um, and a new update to our ATP and USG Flex firewall, I want to just quickly cover additional WAN settings that are now available to you, uh, just so that you are aware of them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and cover that first. And then secondly, I'm going to go on to the added security options versus the flex. Um, there are three security options that are available to you when using the USG uh, ATP series versus the USG flex. And I'll cover those uh, in detail in the little table. And then we'll also do uh, the live demo to kind of go over everything so you can see how everything is set up. So first, let's take a look at the additional WAN settings. So with our gateways, we have additional deployment settings that are now available to you. So if you remember in the previous webinar when I talked about onboarding your USC or your ATP, um, you have to do something called the ZTP, which is your zero touch deployment um, uh, provisioning. So what that does is it requires you to first default the unit back to factory defaults, um, and then you have to have uh, your MAC address and your serial number uh, provided to Nebula and install that information into the Nebula Cloud Center so that it can sync up. And then at that point, you're given uh, the opportunity to configure your WAN settings. And then what it does is it creates a specific file that you either put on a USB drive or it gets emailed to you. And then that particular file then gets uploaded to your firewall in order to make that device cloud ready. Now, I did talk about it previously that that's the ZTP settings that are the certificate that's required in order for you to do this. Um, with newer models that are shipping um, today, they have the certificate installed, so it makes the process a lot more friendlier where you don't have to require uh, that certificate and go through that long process of, you know, going through Nebula, setting everything up, and then getting the file. So that's no longer required if you have the ZTP certificate. One of the things that we've actually added now are more settings for the WAN mode. So you'll see that we have, uh, we have advanced WAN settings such as the MTU, we have PPPoE authentication types, and then we also have PPP with a static IP address. So you'll see here when you're doing your Nebula deployment, when you set up your zero touch mode or your zero touch provisioning mode, um, you'll see that we have the WAN type as PPPoE with static IP. Um, so you'll have your DHCP, your static, your PPPOE, and then now the new PPPOE with static IP address. Additionally, we have also added the authentication type. So we have the CHAP, uh, the PATH, the MS CHAP, and the MS CHAP V2. Uh, additionally, we've also added an MTU setting. So you can set it to 1500, which is this, uh, the, the default for your static DHCP, uh, but when you're using PPPOE, of course, you have to change your MTU size down to 1492. There's also the setting in the local web. So if you were doing the local web Nebula wizard mode, if, again, if you have uh, the ability to go through the initial setup wizard for the local side, what you can do here is we have the MTU option here for your ISP parameters. Uh, and then also we have our ISP assignment. We can set it to static or auto. And then again, our initial setup wizard for setting it up in cloud mode, we can choose the authentication as CHAP and PAP as well. So those are the options that we have here as well. We can also do a local web network test. So we can check our WAN settings for, you know, your authentication type as CHAP and PAP, making sure that your MCU is set properly, and then you can select PPPoE with static IP address. And then we have the WAN settings where you can put your username and password in for your PPPoE as well. Uh, now there's another thing on here as well for checking to see if you have that certificate. So previously, I'd always talked about how the uh, certificate is required for you to skip using that particular file in order to upload the settings to your device. Um, what this says is if you have this native certificate automatically installed on your firewall, 
setting it up in, you know, to get into Nebula is a lot more easier because all you would have to do is just run through the local setup wizard, meaning that when you boot up your device, you factory default it, it'll give you an option to choose if you want to do local on-premise mode or cloud mode. If you do on-premise mode, it'll just take you to your local localized management where the device is managed locally. But if you do a cloud mode, it'll take you through the wizard and then it will then ask you to put in the MAC address and serial number and it will communicate with the device automatically so that you don't have to do the USB trick or uploading the file directly with the link. Um, additionally, I didn't create, grab the screenshot, but we do have a, a new mode on our firewalls where you can go into uh, the cloud settings in the menu. There's a new menu for Nebula, which will allow you to remotely uh, make an on-premise mode device into Nebula. But again, you have to have the ZPP certificate by running, the, you know, checking to see if you have it, if you run the command. So if you go into the CLI, you go into show native mode cert file status. If it shows that the ZPP certificate file exists, um, then you will be able to shortcut not having to do the full ZPP process. So this is a great thing because let's just say, for instance, you have a firewall that's being remotely managed in another location, and it is in standalone mode. If it has that ZTP file and your customer wants to be cloud managed, you can then go into the GUI and then in the cloud section, there is one for Nebula. And then in that Nebula menu, what it'll do is it'll ask you what your IP address is of your WAN. And this is very important because by default, it uses DHCP, but because you're remoting into a device, you want it to have a static IP address. You wanna make sure that that IP address doesn't change because what it'll do during the process is it will wipe the, the device configuration, put it back to factory default. We've put a special mode in our Nebula configurator in 5.20 firmware, where you put the IP address on the WAN and it keeps that WAN setting as it goes through its default settings when you apply it in the Nebula. So that's an, a great option for those who have remotely managed uh, devices that they wanna put into Nebula as long as they have the ZTP certificate. Now let's look at the added security options versus the USG Flex. So you'll see with the USG Flex, we have our web filtering, which is your content filtering, application patrol, IP exception, and URL threat filter, along with anti-malware and our IPS. With USG Flex, you get three added services. You get the DNS threat filter, which is on top of the URL threat filter, IP reputation, and then you also get your sandboxing. And the sandboxing is going to be the service that is the bread and butter of the ATP series, which I will be covering here in just a moment. So let's go ahead and switch over into a live demo. So give me just a moment here and I will go ahead and bring up our live demo that we have set up here. Okay. Okay, so you should see my screen. This is my Nebula screen here for our dashboard for our lab. And you'll see that I have one device online for our application or application gateway. So if we come over here to firewall and we come down to security service, it's gonna bring up our security service menu. So we have content filtering enabled, we have application control, IP exception, DNS and URL threat filter. We have our IP reputation, we have our anti-malware, our sandboxing and our IPS, which is our intrusion prevention system. So real quick, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of our content filtering real quick. I'll do the application patrol as well as the IP exception as well. So starting with content filtering, the way that it works is you create a profile. So you come in here and you create a profile. So let's say that you want to block streaming media. So we'll put in streaming for the name. We'll come down here to block web pages. Action for unrated web pages is set to warn, and our action when service is unavailable is set to warn. This feature here basically means that whenever a web page is accessed, that is part of any category that needs to be reached. If the content uh, the content filter server is unavailable it'll just give a warning. You can also set this to pass if you wanted to, or you can have it automatically block when the content filter service is unavailable. We have built-in templates 
By default, we have a parental control template, but if you want to create your own, come down to the drop down list and click on custom. So now that we have our custom set, we'll come down to the search category and there's a little arrow that points down to open up your category list. And these are all of the categories that you can select for content filtering. So this basically means that whenever a person tries to reach, reach a website, it will go out to the content filter server and check to see exactly what that website category belongs to. So if I wanna block messaging and I wanna block um, entertainment and I wanna block games, um, it will basically block it based on this category. Um, if I wanna block stock trading, I can block text translators, um, sports, there's a lot of different things that you can block based off of these particular categories. So for right now, let's look at media sharing. And then let's also look at entertainment as well. This is gonna be part of your streaming. Um, we also have social network and we also have streaming media if you wanna lump that in as well. So let's go ahead and do streaming media, media sharing and entertainment for right now. Once we've done this, we can also create a specific website we wanna block. So if there's a particular website in general that you wanna block, you can actually put that in the block list. The allow website option gives you a specific profile that you can create that you can allow specific websites that may be blocked by these particular websites that are being coming up on a specific filter. So for instance, let's just say you block streaming media. However, you wanna allow users to access something like iTunes. So you can put in iTunes, their website for Apple, so that you can allow most streaming web media websites to be blocked, but you allow your iTunes. So let's go ahead and click on create. So after you click on create, we have a rule here called streaming. What we can also do is do a redirect URL. So with the redirect, redirect URL, that basically means that if a site is blocked, you can have it redirect to another address. So once this rule has been created, we can go back to our firewall and then we go to our security policy. And also don't forget to save any settings that you do. It will warn you anytime you have made changes to this page and you need to save it. So we'll come back to the firewall. We'll go back to security policy because we need to add this to a particular security policy. So it always works like the firewall in standalone mode. You create a profile and then you add that profile to a security policy. So first we come here to add, we give this a name, we'll call this streaming media, or just call it streaming. The action is gonna sound very, it's gonna sound kind of backwards, but you set it to allow because this is a firewall rule. This is going to allow it through the firewall. But now what we're going to do is create, we're gonna pick that particular um, profile that we did that's gonna block, which is called streaming. So this is allowing, the traffic to go through based off of our source and destination, but we're applying a content filter policy that's going to block it. So it's gonna allow everything else through, but if it hits this particular policy, it will block it. For your source, you put your LAN IP address, and then your destination, you set it to any. Now, if you wanna set this up for different profiles, you can. So you can have a specific um, policy set for different LAN submits or your VLAN. Your destination port is gonna be set to any. And here we do have a new option, which is user. So for user, this is very similar to how we have in our standalone mode. So for instance, if you're gonna be doing any type of web authentication, or if you're gonna be doing a VPN where all of your traffic goes through uh, this particular site through the VPN, you can set it up on a user level if you are doing Active Directory for your AD integration. This basically means that if a user is going through for web authentication to get online where they have to authenticate using their AD credentials in order to get access to the internet, you can also set it up so that it will base its policy based on a particular user. Additionally, you can set up a schedule and then you set up your description. So this is just the basic settings for doing your content filtering. Of course, you go ahead and click on save and then this is all set up. So it's very basic. You can create multiple profiles for multiple subnets, VLANs, and or users if you are doing AV integration within Nebula. It's going back to security services, we're gonna take a look at application patrol. So application patrol is going to be our service that uses 
our signatures in order to look at the packet level, layer seven of the packet level to determine what application is being used. So again, we can create a profile. We're gonna give this a name and we're gonna do streaming media yet again, because we wanna block specific things such as Netflix, Hulu, um, and you know, let's say Apple TV streaming. So we're gonna call this one streaming again. And then now for our log, we wanna set it to log this information. Now for the applications, we do have a search list. So if I come in here and type in Netflix, we have multiple Netflix options. We have Netflix, Netflix audio and video, and Netflix login. So Netflix login will actually block the application from loading the login page in, in your application. Uh, Netflix audio and video will prevent it from loading audio and video, and then the Netflix itself will prevent the actual app from reaching um, the page after if someone tries to log in if you don't have this option enabled. Now, keep in mind, the difference between this and content filtering is that content filtering relies heavily and only on HTTPS traffic. Users who are using a tablet, an iPhone, any type of mobile device that's using the Netflix app or any streaming app is gonna be using different ports. So we can't actually you know, do a content filtering based on those apps on those phones because they're using different ports. They're using basically randomized ports. That's why you wanna use application patrol because we can look at the packet level to determine what that application being used is. So for right now, we're just gonna put in Netflix, go ahead and click on add. We can also do more here. So we can just type in Netflix audio video as well. And then let's just do Netflix login. Okay, so now we have our media streaming category. We can add more, like if we wanna add say Hulu, uh, let's go ahead and just add in that real quick. And there's Hulu right there. From here, what we can do is just go ahead and click on create. Come down here to save. And then again, we're gonna do the same thing again. Let's go ahead and actually change this to, we'll change the name of this to uh, streaming apps, just so we can differentiate it in the security policy. So we'll come back here to firewall and then we'll come to security policy. And we're gonna go back and add a new security policy. This time we're gonna say, streaming app, and then we're gonna select streaming apps from the application profile. Then again, we can select the LAN one subnet. We can set the destination to any, destination port to any, and then again, the description if we wanna add one. So now what we've done is we've done two things. Firewall rule outbound, let's see if it's outbound rule duplicated at two. Let's see, here we go. Okay, let's change this up a little bit here. What we're gonna do here, let's come back to here. We should add it to this one here. So we can put it in the same one because I created two similar firewall rules. So we wanna put it here under, add it here. So let me save this really quick. Let me go back out of it. Let me back out to a different menu, have it reload. There we go. And now we have it set in the same rule because the reason why it gave me that error was because I created two similar rules that even though I was using different application filtering, it saw that the source and destination were the same and so it, made, it said it was a duplicate. However, you can put multiple rules under the same or multiple policies under the same rule. So let's go ahead and click on save. And so that takes care of our streaming apps and our streaming websites. Of course, you can add more things to this particular rule that you have set, but just for making it very you know, simplistic sake, we just wanna put the streaming apps and our streaming websites in. So moving along, let's go back to the security service. And this time we're gonna look at IP exception. So you're probably wondering why you wanna have an IP exception. IP exception is when you created these rules, but let's just say that you have something like a SIP phone or a specific um, application that needs to come into another website. You have a SIP phone or a VoIP phone that you don't wanna have checked against these particular rules. You can go to IP exception, you can click on add, 
And then we can put in the IP address of whatever resource that is. So let's just say that I have a SIP phone at this particular IP address. I can put this in and let's say the destination of the SIP um, address was, we'll just make up one, we'll use um, 4.2.2 as a DNS. But let's just say that the uh, SIP phone always is going to this particular SIP server. We can make it so that all traffic originating from this particular device going to this particular IP address bypasses all of these particular rules here. So therefore they do not get checked. So even though this is in the same LAN zone as our content filtering and our application control, we don't necessarily need to have those or this particular device checked against these rules because this is going to a specific website or a specific server that we know is legit. This is where our SIP server or calls are being routed through. Um, in this particular example, it's not this actual IP address, but let's just say that it is, our calls are being routed to this particular IP address coming from this particular source IP address in our network. Therefore, we do not need it to be checked against this. And this is gonna, you know, this is gonna free up resources so that it doesn't have to be checked every single time traffic leaves this IP address going to this particular IP address. So that's what IP exception does. It's really useful when you don't want specific IP addresses to be checked against our security services. Uh, moving along here, we have our DNS and URL threat filter. So with our DNS and URL threat filter, we can check our signatures that we have to see if a specific DNS entry is legit or if it is malicious. We can also check our URLs as well. So if we have a threat filter policy, we turn on our log, we turn on the threat filter, and then we have two different options here. So the DNS threat filter policy either says to redirect or pass. So that basically means that if the particular DNS entry, um, we're, we're, we're gonna inspect the DNS before it goes out to the internet. So if you're going to a specific website, it's going to intercept the DNS query and check it against our signature database. If that particular DNS entry for a specific website, you know, you go to a specific website and then it is you know, the DNS comes back and says that this particular website is malicious or it's been found to be malicious, then it will redirect that particular website that you're trying to go to, to a specific IP address. So the default will then send it to itself. So we'll have a, we have a URL threat filter deny message, basically meaning that whenever the redirect happens, you'll just get redirected to a page that says, website access is restricted, please contact the administrator. Of course, this can be customized, or what you can do is set up a custom IP address. So let's just say that you have a, an IP address that you wanted to redirect to. Let's say that you have your own particular website or your own business. You can have it redirect to the IP address of your hosted website so that anytime the DNS is in, or the DNS comes back malicious, it can redirect to a site or IP address of your choice. Now, just be aware that here's a category list that you can specify against your DNS and URL threats. We have our anonymizers, spam URLs, browser exploits, spyware, adware keyloggers, malicious downloads, malicious sites, and phishing. Now, if there is a site that does not get triggered by any of these, you can create a specific block list. Additionally, we do allow you to create an allow list, and this is a very useful tool. The reason being is that sometimes a specific malicious website that has been picked up by our signatures ends up being shut down and gets recycled to a legit IP address. So if somebody starts a Wix page or any other web hosting services and they unfortunately get that recycled IP address or a domain, then what ends up happening is that particular website gets is still is flagged until this signature gets updated that that particular site is clean. If that does happen and your customers or your employees come to you and say, well, this particular site is legit, I'm getting it blocked, you can check it out for yourself. And if it is a legit website, you can put it in the allow list. We support SQDNs for the wild cards for that particular site. So you can do say asterisk, um, asterisk like zyso.com or zyso.com asterisk. So it does the SQDN. Additionally, we do have an option for a URL threat filter external block list. 
What this means is that you can create a specific, um, a specific um, list that has a block list that is defined. So you would put your name for your block list and then you would put the database. So you can create your own database of block lists for IP addresses if you want to. Additionally, we have an option for scheduled updates. So you wanna make sure that your signatures are up to date. Again, if a particular website was found to be malicious, but it is a valid website, you know, their signatures are being updated constantly. So you wanna make sure that you have the most up-to-date signature for your URL threat filter block list. You can set it to schedule daily or weekly, but we suggest that you always schedule it for daily and schedule it for off hours, either after hours or before the workday begins. Moving along, we have our IP reputation. So very similar to our URL and DNS threat filter, IP reputation looks at a specific IP's reputation. So there is a website called dnsdl.info. That website basically tracks uh, or gives you the ability to use external databases to scan particular IP addresses that have a reputation. So a particular IP address, if it is known to send out spam, it ends up getting flagged as an IP address that is you know, a spam website or it is a malicious website. So again, very similar to our DNS URL threat filter where it looks at the DNS queries for the URL for that particular website. The, the IP reputation looks at the particular IP address directly. So again, you wanna make sure that this is enabled and set the log. We have our policy, we can set it either to block or pass. So if you set it to block, if a website comes or if an IP address comes up as being um, malicious or suspicious, it will automatically block it. You can choose to also pass it if you want to, if you wanna do some testing. Now we have different category thresholds. So a particular IP address in our signature, let's just say that an IP address of you know, 10.10.10.5, of course that's an internal IP address, but for this sake of example, we're gonna use that as you know, a malicious website that's out there on the internet. So let's say that 10.10.10.5 is a malicious website. It's been rated as malicious, but there's three different levels of maliciousness for that particular website. You know, there's low, medium, and high. So you have the ability to choose the threat level as to which the threat, threat threshold is set to. So you can set it to only block medium and above, or you can have it set to block high. You can also have it set to pass low and, low and above or block low and above. So you have different options here of what you'd wanna do. Now, when it comes to the category list, again, very similar, but slightly different. We have anonymous proxies, we have spam sources. This is a huge one because there's a lot of IP addresses out there that have been flagged as spam. These are gonna be IP addresses that are tied to mailing lists or IP addresses that are tied to mail host names. So spam sources will get blocked. We have denial of service uh, IP addresses, IP addresses that were used to conduct DOS attacks. We have Tor proxies, we have IPs that are bound to exploits, web attacks, anything that has a negative reputation. Um, so if a website was um, considered or an IP address was considered to be doing something such as, you know, sending out mailing lists and not pe removing people from their unsubscribe list, um, they could end up with a negative reputation. We also have our phishing, we have our scanners, and we have our botnets. And again, very similar to our URL and DNS threat filter, we have our block and allow list. So if an IP address does show up that is not being blocked, you can put it in the block list. Conversely, you can create an allow list. So if an IP address does come up as being a malicious website, you can put it in your allow list. Again, with the URL, threat, URL and DNS threat filter, you can in, ex, uh, put in your own external block list. Again, you would just put in the name, the external database, and the description of that particular external block list. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that your schedule is set to daily so that it will update your signatures on a daily basis whenever a new signature is found. Now, these rules here, everything from 
our, um, our application patrol and above require a policy to be created and then apply to your firewall rule. However, everything from IP, set, IP exception and below does not require a policy to be added to your firewall rule. It is a global setting. Therefore, you cannot um, apply, say, your IP reputation and your DNS URL threat filter to specific subnets. It is a global catch-all for the whole device. So please keep that in mind. Uh, moving along, we have our anti-malware. So our anti-malware is basically our antivirus. And you'll see here, we have our enable option to turn on and off, and then we have our log. Now, when it comes to scan mode, there's two different scan modes. There's our stream mode, and then there is our express mode, and then there's a combination, which is our hybrid, which is a combination of both of these. So your stream mode. Your stream mode is basically going to be the fastest because it's going to use the firewall's own internal database. So it's going to look at its own database of signatures to find out whenever a file comes in and scans it, it's going to scan it against its local database. Our express mode is going to be the one that is scanned against a cloud signature database. So the difference here is that our cloud database is going to be slightly bigger because the stream mode, when you apply your signature to the local database, due to constraints of memory on the device, you're going to have less signatures. Uh, compared to the cloud signature database. But the difference between the two is going to be speed. So in stream mode, you have slightly fewer signatures, but the scan is going to be a lot faster because it doesn't have to query the cloud in order to get the information. However, with the express mode, even though it's going to be a little bit slower, the database is going to be a little bit larger. So it's kind of a trade-off between the two. So you have to choose if you want to have a fast scan with a, you know, a slightly lower database count versus having a slower, a slower scan with a higher signature database count. Now, if you want to do both, that's going to be hybrid mode where it will scan locally first, and then if it cannot find a signature that matches that particular threat, it will then switch to the cloud mode and check the cloud-based signatures. If you do hybrid mode, just be aware that it's going to be the slowest of the three options because it's scanning locally and it will scan externally. Now, you'll see that there's actually different options here. So if I enable stream mode, you'll see that we have an option to destroy compressed files that cannot be decompressed. We have a block list and an allow list. But in express mode, we have cloud query, where we can query specific file types. So you see these are the different file types that we can query, whereas in stream mode, it basically will query everything for you. So just keep that in mind that if you do express mode, you have to put in the file types you want it to scan for. It's not going to scan the, all of these automatically. You have to input them in on your own. With hybrid mode, same thing. Because it has a cloud query enabled on there, you have to put all of the file types in there. Now, the option to destroy compressed files that can, cannot be decompressed, um, you can scan decompressed zip files, but this option here, I would caution against, mainly because of the fact that if you have a zip file that is password protected, let's just say that you know your company is doing real estate and you pass zip files. Uh, with sensitive information, and that information in the zip file is password protected. Well, the problem then becomes that if you enable this option, it can't decompress that file because it's password protected, and therefore it will destroy the file outright. So just be very, very careful with this option. We also have our block list and our allow list. So let's just say for the block list, if there's a particular file that you've seen downloaded multiple times that you know is a malicious file from a website that looks legit, but it somehow did not get caught by your signatures, you can put in that particular file pattern for that particular file. So let's just say the file was a PDF. So we'll say it was um, a floor plan.pdf. 
So if it sees this particular file, it will block list this file. Uh, on the flip side, let's just say that uh, your IT managers have set up some resources for onboarding new clients that come in or new employees, and they have to download a driver for printers to access the local printer to print files. Let's just say that for some reason, the signature database is flagging the driver for the printer, but you know it is a legit file. What you can do is you can put that in the allow list, so therefore it does not get caught by the anti-malware scan. Now, moving on here at sandboxing, this is going to go hand in hand with our anti-malware. So I'll give you a brief explanation of what the sandboxing does. So when you have a virus that is uh, propagating throughout the environment, your scan is gonna look at your signature database. When it comes to antiviruses and anti-malware, signatures are more reactive than proactive. And that's mainly because you have to wait for someone to get infected and then a signature has to be created to recognize that file. There are instances where new viruses and new variants come out and new malware that comes out that hasn't been detected and it hasn't, uh, there hasn't been a signature created for it yet and it slips past your anti-malware. That's where sandboxing comes in. So when you have sandboxing enabled, if a file comes in that looks suspicious, the anti-malware will scan it. Now, if it scans it and it doesn't find a signature that matches it, it will then move over to sandboxing mode if you have it enabled. Sandboxing will then take that file if there's no signature that matches it, it will send it to the cloud to be analyzed. When it's analyzed in the cloud, it actually takes that file and to determine what it does, it runs it in multiple iterations to see exactly if that file is malicious or suspicious. It runs it in a sandbox environment that's closed off, so it cannot infect any other devices in the cloud in its own instance. And then once that information is determined as to if it is a safe file or not, a signature is created that is then sent back to not only your device, but it updates the signature database for all the devices. Therefore, you'll know if that particular file is safe or not. So that on the next subsequent download, it automatically knows hey, that file is either dangerous or it is a legit file. So when it comes to sandboxing, you want to enable it, set it to log so you can capture the logs, and then you have the policy to automatically destroy. So if it bypasses the anti-malware because there's no signature, it goes to the cloud to be analyzed, and it does come back as a malicious file. It sends, it back to, it sends directions back to the firewall saying, hey, this file is no longer, you know, is, is not legit. It is a most file. Destroy it, and it will, it will destroy it. Now, we have an option to inspect downloaded files. This will scan and do sandboxing on files that are being downloaded. But just be aware, if you enable this option, it will slow down your downloads because it is going to be inspecting it as it downloads the file. And then here we have our submission types. We have zip files, exe, doc files, PDF. Um, flash or you know Macromedia flash files and then RTF documents. So these are all the um, options you have here. So you have your your PDF, RTF, SWF, doc, exe, and zip files. Those are the ones that are scanned. So that's basically how sandboxing works. And again, this option is only available. This option here is only available for the ATP series because the USG Flex does not include sandboxing. And then finally, moving along, our final subject here is our intrusion prevention systems. So this is IPS. So by default, um, it's set to detect. So you're gonna wanna put also on prevention, not just detection. And what this basically does is it looks at, again, the packets coming in to your firewall on your WAN side. So as packets are coming in, you know, the firewall will scan to see how those packets are arranging themselves. So let's just say a very common one is um, packets that are coming in out of order. That looks kind of suspicious because that could be a possible sign of an attack. So if it does see that, it will detect it. And then for prevention-wise, it will then drop traffic from that source. So it keeps you protected for anybody trying to probe your network or possibly carry out possible attacks, you know, packet-based attacks. So. If you're looking at things such as um, 
you know, they're sending malformed packets in order to kind of probe the network. So it will detect a lot of those types of attacks. So IPS is a very useful thing to have. And again, if you want to find out, it's available on both the USG and the ATP series. But all you have to do is enable it and make sure that, that prevention is enabled because by default, it will only detect. So once you have everything done and saved, go ahead and click on save at the bottom, and then you're all done with the settings for your security for the ATP. So that's going to wrap it up for this particular webinar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the floor open for some Q&A. Yes, Marcus, we do have some questions here. The first one is, what does the DNS filter do? Okay. So with the DNS filter, it's going to intercept your DNS request and look up the actual DNS query and check to see if that particular website is um, basically a valid website or not. So let's just say that, you know, your customers come in and they put their own DNS setting on their computer. Let's say they use Google DNS. Well, then if you have that, the URL threat filter is kind of a backup, but what you can do is you can have it intercept the DNS query before it leaves the firewall and then check against the database. So it kind of intercepts and sits in the middle and intercepts the DNS request to see if that particular website you're trying to visit is malicious or suspicious. Okay, great. The second question, it's regarding the IP reputation. What about IP addresses on shared servers? We have found that IP reputation will block servers on a shared server to a website that is not harmful. Yeah, so that does happen sometimes. Um, it, it's kind of weird that sometimes you'll see legit websites or a, a web server, either local or remote, that actually just shows up as um, a non-legit and it blocks it. That's why you have to put it in the whitelist. Um, and what you can do is, we've worked with tech support to do this, but what you can do is if you are finding specific legit external web server websites that are showing up as being blocked, you can contact our technical support team to provide them with the information as to what IP addresses are being blocked or coming up as malicious or suspicious. And they can forward that over to our engineering team and then they can kind of go through the signatures and you know verify that that site is correct and they can have the signature modified to allow that particular website so it doesn't get blocked. All right, um, good answer. Now, next question is, do older devices have the provisioning certificate? Um, no, okay, so if your device is, if you've had a device in service, um, an ATP or USG that's been in service uh, over the past year, it's not going to have the ZTP certificate. And, you know, as it turns out, the ZTP certificate does not get loaded when you upload the new firmware. So if you're going to the latest firmware, which is 5.20, um, it does not contain that ZTP certificate. Uh, this is just done for security purposes. They want to make sure that you go through the zero touch provisioning process at least once on the older unit so that it connects directly with the Nebula um, Cloud Center to pull that certificate. So it's a secure option so that it gets that, that, that certificate. Now, newer devices that have been shipped uh, within the past couple of months should automatically have that ZTP installed directly from the factory. And again, what you can do is um, run this command. I'll go back so you can see it. Um, you wanna run the command here, show native mode, search file status to see if you have the ZTP certificate. So um, if you purchase a firewall, um, you know, in the past month or two, it's quite possible that it already has a certificate on there. Um, you just wanna run this command in order to find out if that certificate is loaded on the unit. Great, all right, um, next question. The sandboxing cause a drop in internet speeds when enabled? Um, yeah, so sandboxing, depending on how you have it configured, um, specifically when you are scanning download files, it will cause a drop in overall throughput of the device. Um, this is the main reason why the ATP series has uh, sandboxing, and that's mainly because of the fact that the throughput is generally going to be a little bit more higher over the Flex series because um, the, the internal hardware has the ability to kind of 
um, handle um, the sandboxing aspect so you don't lose too much speed over the USB flex. Um, so that's the, you know, that's the main reason why you're going to see um, a slowdown in speed. It's just because you're going to be scanning all the traffic coming in specifically on downloads, um, but you shouldn't see a very large, significant drop, but just be aware you will see a drop in speed. Great. Okay. Last but not the least, is there a way to get a report of what is blocked with sandboxing? Uh, yes. So that's going to be available in Secure Reporter. Um, there is an option within the firewall or sort of the nebula to connect your uh, ATP to Secure Reporter, and Secure Reporter will um, pull that information. That's an additional license. But the Secure Reporter license is a cloud-based syslog server. And when you have it set to log, like you have your, um, your security services set to log, it will pull that information, send it to Secure Reporter, which is a cloud-based reporting software. You can log into Secure Reporter and look at your device, and it will give you a report as to what was blocked, um, the threat level. Um, and also, when it comes to sandboxing, it will show you, um, how, many, you know, how many files were scanned, how many files were sent to um, the cloud to be uh, analyzed, how many came back as positive or negative, it'll give you all that information. And then you can also send it out in a daily, weekly, or monthly report to both yourself and your customer so that they have the visibility of what's going on in their network. Um, so set your report is gonna be uh, one of the best tools to use to uh, see exactly what's going on with your sandboxing. All right, um, Marcus, we have one more. Okay, um, sure. If I if I need to execute a shell command like no arpsil activate, activate rather, how can I do that if ATP is connected to Nebula? Um, yeah, you could still run uh, commands remotely. Um, there is a remote command option. Let me see if I could pull up the Nebula account really quick and I can show you where you can run command. So let me come back here. So if you come to firewall and you go to monitor, uh, if you scroll down, there is a remote access option. So if you enable this, it'll establish on port 22 uh, where you can log in. The credentials for logging in are gonna be specific to your device. Um, if you go to organization mode, um, there, I believe it's in um, settings, um, it, gives, it overrides the default password with the password in Nebula that you set. Um, so you can log in over SSH, and then um, using SSH, you can then run commands remotely. So you do have the ability to do it with remote access, but just be aware that this is a um, uh, a feature that requires you to have um, the security license enabled on the device to access this feature. Um, but you do have the ability to run CLI commands remotely, um, just establishing a connection with the live tools through uh, the cloud the Nebula Cloud Control Center. Okay, thanks, Marcus. And I guess that would be it. That's all the questions for now, for today. Back to you. Okay. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, if you have any further questions or if you have um, any comments, you can uh, feel free to email me directly. Um, I've go ahead and put my, uh, I went ahead and put my email directly on the screen here in the slide. My email address is marcush at zyco.com. Uh, feel free to email me with any questions that you may have uh, that may come up after the come up after the webinar has concluded. Um, feel free to email me and email me, and I will answer them um, as I get them. All right, great. Um, thank you, everybody, and um, that wraps up our webinar for today. We'll see you on our next webinar. That's on Thursday. It's an introduction to Nebula. Have, um, I'll see you on Thursday, I guess. All right, have a good one, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.